Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Gotta say, when we were reading in this morning, planning our broadcast, all three hours of it, we knew we wanted to get an update on what we needed to know when it comes to geopolitics. Still so much going on. We also wanted to get an update on how the U.S. election plays into it. It's something that we've asked some of our guests over the last couple of hours. One name at the top of our list that we knew we wanted to reach out to is Ed Price. Here's why. He's a former British trade official. He's now a non-resident senior fellow at NYU. Also principal for geopolitical forecasting at the global intelligence and consulting firm Ergo. He's advised members of the European and British parliaments And that's just a little bit of what he's done. We always have fun. We get to dig into everything that's going on around the world. Ed, great to have you back with us. How are you? Very well. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Uh, Doing well, trying to keep up with stuff. And I I, kind of want to start with the elections because you did take a road trip. I think this is really cool. There's so much when you get in a car and drive around this country and really talk to people. You really get a good feeling of what's top of mind for them. And you get an idea of how they feel about candidates. Uh, And a lot of them have some strong positions. Tell us what you did over the summer. Hey, thanks, Carol. Well, so I drove from New York to San Francisco uh, via the northern route, and then I drove back uh, via the south, uh, via Dallas, via New Orleans, and really just tried to stop as much as possible and just make conversation, right? Just stop someone and say, hey, how are you? Um, By the way, what do you think about the election? What do you think about the economy? And they everyone (laughs) greeted you with open arms, right? I mean, Right. So this is the interesting thing. Um, We've heard this so many times. Jimmy Carville, it's the economy, stupid. Um, It kind of is and it kind of isn't. And one of the things that I noticed uh, most was that in any given generic conversation with anyone, really, um, after they'd said, oh, you know what, I really hate the other guy, right, the other candidate, they would then basically uh, come up with a list of things that they wanted whoever it is that's president to do um, at home that were very similar. And so there's, you know, we always talk about polarization in this country. That That is the case. But there's also this um, sort of bipartisan feeling that somehow, some way, uh, the economy could be better. Now, that might mean that, you know, Harris is in trouble because it's, it's in some ways her economy. But it's interesting to me that so many Americans said exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's interesting that that's what you came away with. Um, but it's I, also I, so in stark contrast to so much data out there. Right. I mean, we, we, we spoke, spoke to Josh Reeves at Gusto earlier, and he's like, there's never been a better time to start a small business in the United States right now. Data point after data point, Carol, showing that for a lot of people, the economy is really good. Exactly. And yet, Americans, there's a lot of Americans, as you know, Ed, that don't feel so good. I mean, based on your conversations, did you get a feel of... Um, who might ultimately win come November. We know it's a very close race. We see the polls. We are reminded of it daily uh, or hourly. But did you get a good feel of which way it could go? And is it just based on the uh, signs that were on people's lawns? Oh, my goodness. Okay, listen, if if presidents were elected via signage, um, Donald Trump would be the Roman emperor. Because I can tell you guys, in, in you know, hand on heart, I didn't see a single Harris sign in the Rust Belt, I didn't see okay. a single half line. No, seriously. I know, I, I get it. I, I, I went around the country a lot in the last couple of months. One question I'll ask, though, is when were you doing this? What month? Because remember, July 21st is when Biden dropped out. Yeah. And her, the signs yeah. weren't around. The signs weren't around for a while. So August, the, the whole month of August. It's okay. a really good point about data. And of course, it might be that the missing signs um just aren't there because either they haven't been printed or because people don't want to put them up um in which case you might say that uh, richard nixon's silent majority is going to go blue this year hmm, um but i've got to tell you and you know I'll, I'll declare my bias i i'm voting this time i'm voting against donald trump so there's my bias mm-hmm. um me not seeing a single harris sign and seeing ginormous trump signs you know you can't help but think okay this guy's gonna win it's a good point. I've, I, I think I've talked about this before, uh, but I was in Colorado a few weeks ago and um, it seemed like there were there were two things that I'll share. One is that there were a lot of local signs that were clearly proclaiming the way one person felt, mm-hmm. like who the candidates were that they were voting for that didn't necessarily Ed, have a presidential sign with them. So it was like county commissioner, U.S. Senate, Congress or rather Congress, uh, House, not Senate, 
I saw a lot of house signs and local state legislature signs, but not necessarily signs proclaiming president, which I thought really interesting, showing the way people were thinking down ballot. That's super interesting, too. And where I live, I'm uh, I'm in a red county, but I'm getting, you know, uh, leaflets from both sides, both parties, and they've stopped putting their political party on them. Um, hmm. It's just the name of the candidate, which I think is maybe another interesting data point. I do also wonder, you know, so much there was an interesting um, time story, actually, today, the New York Times about and it said the Trump voters who don't believe Trump when the former president endorses violence and proposes using the government to attack his enemies many of his supporters assumes it's just an act I actually had a conversation uh, with an individual over the past week when we were out on the west coast same thing said you know I just think when when the former president Donald Trump says things he's just trying to like um under you know kind of put people off if you will whether it's allies whether it's political opponents just kind of shake things up but not that he's necessarily going to follow through with all these things. We know from his first administration, he does follow through with some things. But I, I wonder what you make of that argument or that thinking. I wouldn't want to take the risk, frankly. Um, as I say, I have a bias. Mm. I think he's a um, clear and present danger to, to borrow from Tom Clancy to the United States Constitution. That's my view. But the interesting thing, I think, about sort of, you know, me turning up in hunting stores and 7-Elevens, um, and not being a pollster and not really being a journalist is that very often I would speak to people who do support Trump, um, but then they would sort of they give me like the second and third layer, too. And one guy that comes to mind, um, he's running a hunting store in Oregon, uh, where, by the way, there's a desert, which I didn't realize. But there he is running. A hunting <laughs> it store. is. Yeah, it's crazy. You should check it out. I, I was very surprised. Um, but but he sort of said to me, I'm voting Trump. But there are things I don't like about the guy. And I wouldn't talk like that in front of my kids. So, you know, that's still oh. there. And maybe I got to hear a bit more of that because, you know, who am I? Nobody. I'm not a pollster. Yeah, I guess the question is, to what extent these folks show up? And also, based on where you were, Ed, you know, Oregon, a state like Oregon, not exactly a swing state right now. I mean, the Pennsylvania observation that you made were, were really were really interesting. And you did drive through a lot of swing states, certainly. But it's, yeah. you know, as you know, we live in a world where... The electoral college and i think mark gongloff our columnist at bloomberg opinion who covers climate change described as basically a football stadium full of people deciding the election Oof, yes that's probably true um so look i'm, in ba I'm back in new york state now probably some of those people aren't too far away in pennsylvania um this was non-scientific as i say but if you just based it on visual evidence uh conversational evidence uh, it, it feels like on the surface of things, Trump has this in the bag. Um, now, that said, there's always that chance that, as we know, in uh, an election this close, um, you know, that the other side pips through for some reason or other. But uh, my my feeling is that that Trump could really get to, to the end here. So, Ed, why did you write about this in the context of the silent majority uh, in the Richard Nixon area? Why go back there? Well, I think in, in part it's because um, I also have this side hustle teaching uh, students, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been doing that for like five or six years now. Really enjoy it. But I've seen um, a change in the the body politic, so to speak, of, of the student body. And it seems to me that there's at least one parallel with the Vietnam War, which is that there are um, moralistic imperatives in the minds of protesters to oppose US foreign policy. Uh, now, for me, that's that's false. That's not a, an equivalence that works because Vietnam was, a, as things turned out, an error and the war that Israel's fighting was imposed on it. But, you know, Richard Nixon was really trying to say in that speech that, look, you may not hear the people out there for Richard Nixon. Uh, he liked to speak about himself in the third person, but they're out there. They're just not protesting. Mm -hmm. And so the question was, are the people that aren't really out on the streets, are the people that aren't uh, displaying big Trump signs thinking about voting for Harris? And I'm afraid to say I don't know. Yeah, I feel like there's a fair amount of questions about, you know, that and just kind of then what it means for the outcome. I am also curious, Ed, you're back from overseas. We talk a lot about whether it's U.S. allies, their concerns about the outcome of the election. What insight can you give us on that front? I think um, from my perspective, from, um, you know, European ties that I have, uh, foreigners uh, in the UK and Europe think this is probably an existential election. 
um, I'm head heading over to Japan in, in a couple of months. Um, I imagine they think the same thing. And a lot of this comes down to NATO, right? And whether or not if Trump is reelected, um, he goes and does, to your point, Carol, about whether he actually does the things he says, actually does go ahead and, and pull the, the US out of NATO in a meaningful way. Um, and that's probably a segue in some, at some point into the Ukrainian behavior uh, on the battlefield. So foreigners right now, I think, are really scratching their heads about how exactly there could be such a bifurcated choice in the world of foreign policy between what we presume Harris will do and what Trump might. There's one caveat. They do seem to be joined at the hip in agreeing that Beijing is a problem. Mm -hmm. And it does seem whoever wins, as we know, trade policy will continue down a, a confrontational path. So after living in the U.S. and traveling around the U.S., just in the last minute that we have with you, then we're going to come back and do some more. How do you explain to them that divide, that separation? To Americans? No, to people outside the U.S. People outside? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, look, I've been here 10 years now. I, I took the oath. I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, I think that the longer you're here as someone who was born in Europe, the, lo the, the easier it is to understand um, what the American catchphrases mean. Uh, I'll be honest with you, 20 years ago, I, I would roll my eyes when I heard a monologue on freedom and being free, and I'd think, well, that's very silly. Um, now I'm less snotty, uh, hmm. and I've realized that um, so many American traits um, are designed for living basically in the middle of nowhere. I think that's why Americans are friendly, I think that's why Americans share a lot more about themselves quite quickly. Um, it's certainly why a lot of Americans carry guns. Um, but the division itself, if I'm talking about that to, to friends at home, um, like I started this segment, is to say, I don't think it's that deep. And I think that when you really ask Americans, the average American, what do you want? Mm -hmm. um, they want a, a fair wage. They want their kids to do well. And they want some form of security, albeit they're now what? thinking about security closer to home. We're going to talk about that security, especially when it comes to geopolitics. We're going to come back with Ed Price, Senior Fellow at NYU. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. I want to get right back to Ed Price, former British trade official. He has advised members of the European and British parliaments. Today, he's known resident senior fellow over at uh, New York University, and he's principal for geopolitical forecasting at the global intelligence and consulting firm Ergo. He is still with us from upstate New York. Hey, listen, you opened the door, mentioned um, we talked NATO a little bit and you know, what it might mean in terms of the U.S. involvement going forward when it comes to the war between Russia and Ukraine. It is amazing to me, Ed, or not surprising, that there was a period where every day one of the top stories on the Bloomberg had to do with the war between those um, two countries. Obviously, now we have the Middle East we're following, and that is atop the lists of concerns. Geopolitically, though, let's talk about Russia, Ukraine, and where you think this might go and how the U.S. election outcome, you know, might impact that. Well, thank you, Carol. I mean, it's it's astonishing and sad that we've yeah. been talking to each other now um, for years about, about this war, uh, and it's entering its third winter. So I think where it's gone is uh, more or less where the broad analytical community expected it to go, which was stalemate. Um, there are, of course, two caveats to that. One is time, which is that the Russians are fighting a war of attrition. Uh, and the other is, for want of a better uh, phrase, bravery, in that the Ukrainians have now um, thrust into the Kursk region um, with their own offensive. My interpretation of that offensive is that it is uh, designed as a, a message, um, a, a plea to the United States mm -hmm. um, saying, look, we can do the job. Uh, we have the will. Give us the means. And of course, we are still sitting on uh, decisions such as whether or not uh, long range weaponry should be used, should be allowed to be used on Russian soil. So a lot will come down to who's sitting in the White House, I think. What, what do you say to U.S. citizens who might be like, well, it's the Europeans problem? I'm playing devil's advocate here, as you would, as you can tell, but say it's for the Europeans to figure out to support, to provide funding and weapons. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that Munich in 1938 was the Europeans problem. And then after that, Poland in 1939 was the Europeans problem. And then after that, it wasn't. It was ours. It was America's problem. And America has a fundamental core national interest in containing if not defeating uh, aggressive military powers in the world. I mean, this is almost one of the top three American things, right? It's like mm -hmm. apple pie, uh, <laughs> the aforementioned freedom and beating dictators. 
Hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm surprised when I when I hear that narrative. I think it's it's tied in a strange way to this um, Trump wing of the Republican Party, if there's another wing left, in which Russia is is held up as an example, Hungary is held up as an example of, of how to do business, how to run a country. It's it's very strange, um, but of course it's patently false. And should Putin defeat Ukraine um, in the field, we're in we're in a world of trouble. Meaning what? There'll be Poland or something else next. Well, first of all, um, dictatorships everywhere will be emboldened. Mm. I think that there's an obvious link between uh, the relationship between Russia and Iran. And Iran was obviously emboldened to embolden others such as Hezbollah and Hamas to attack Israel. So this is not one war. This war is an ecosystem. Um, but meaning as well that the um, revanchist uh, nationalist Russia that Putin has unleashed in the last decade or so uh, and that we have failed to confront does have its eyes on the restoration of a, a former Tsarist empire. It's not the Soviet model. This is a this is a red herring. It's the Tsarist imperial model of Russia in which there are these um, vassals, these occupied vassals around its borders as a form of self-defense. You can you can perfectly well imagine why the Russians are paranoid. Um, they've been invaded several times. Uh, believe it or not, British and Japanese troops have been on Russian soil in the 20th century and so on. Um, but unless we, the West, properly confront this aggression, uh, I, I forecast that it will only get worse. OK, so make the case then if members of the U.S. House and Senate are listening or watching right now, make the case as to why you believe it's essential to support Ukraine. So there's an idealistic case and there is a practical case. The idealistic case is the one that I just gave you. I would appeal to any elected official in the United States um, I would appeal to their heart and I would say, look, uh, America has a unique role in the world. Jefferson let the genie out of the bottle. It's a good genie. It's about human freedom and it should be universal. That's the idealistic case. There's also um, uh, a, a monetary case, right? There's a fiscal case, which is how much money do you want to spend putting Putin back in his box? And as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is cynical. Um, you could say, well, who really cares about Ukraine? What we really want is to defeat and degrade Russian power. And, and by the way, I think we've been doing that. So I think that Putin has made tactical gains measured in years, but has probably set himself back strategically uh, as measured in decades, right? So he's not invincible. The Kursk offensive has shown this. And if we just want to send um, a rounding error of our national budget and inventory that we otherwise would have mothballed to brave people fighting for freedom, that's an idealistic thing, but it's also very practical because, again, otherwise, um, you think about Ukraine going down. I mean, then, you know, Poland, the Baltics are in trouble uh, or Putin says that's enough for now and sends all of his expertise and or materiel soldiers, say, to Iran in a war with Israel. So this we really have to think about this practically as well. Hey, Ed, one thing I wanted to ask you also coming back from being uh, in the UK and overseas um, are people getting frustrated with the U.S. support of Israel? Yes, but they shouldn't be. Um, this is a very sensitive topic. I recently wrote an op-ed about this. Mm -hmm. um, I thought very carefully about writing it, uh, but I did. And it asked three questions. One, is Israel fighting a war of self-defense? The answer is yes. The second question was, is Israel conducting a genocide? And the answer is no. And then the third question was, is Israel bringing us all to the brink of World War III? And the answer was, I don't know. Hmm. Um, if you spend more time thinking about security in terms of appeasement and 1938, as I mentioned, then Israel was attacked and is doing the absolute right thing in defending itself. If you think this is more like a 1962 Cuban missile scenario globally, then perhaps we uh, should be getting to the time that we wrap this thing up. I'm in the former camp. Uh, a lot of people are in the latter, but I would say that every single time Putin has said, look, I'm going to use um, terrible weapons. He doesn't always use or ever use the word nuclear weapons. Mm. Um, and we've said, well, actually, we will cross that red line. He's done nothing. So I, I think we are acting um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, weak, a weak attitude and a strong hand, and we should get on and finish the job. I'm going to hate myself for asking you this, but 40 seconds quickly. What do you think is the number one threat to the world, be it an individual, a dictator or a country? Just quickly. I think the number one threat to the world is a all out uh, conflict between China and the United States that turns nuclear. 
Uh, the good news is I think that's unlikely right now. Uh, the Chinese do not want to attack Taiwan before they see how these other two conflicts play out. And so there's another maybe third reason for your senators and your congressmen and congresswomen avoiding World War Three. We did it. You took we us around out. the world, yeah. as you always do. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Glad we can reach out to you and that your hours coincide a little bit better with us right now. <laughs> the U.S., Russia, Ukraine, Israel, more of the Middle East, China. We did it all with Ed Price. Yeah, and as we often say, it's all complicated, um, him laying it out, though, so clearly. Ed Price, thank you so much. Senior fellow at NYU, former British trade official. Uh, thank you, thank you. This is Bloomberg Business Week.